The views and opinions expressed do not necessarily reflect those of Access for Wayne, the Allen County Public Library, or any other supporting groups. If you'd like to produce a show, call us at 260-421-1250. This is Patty Hunter of Patty's Page. Welcome to my show. Today's special guest is Michael Reagan. He is an artist, well-known portrait artist. So tell me, where were you born and raised? Born and raised in Seattle, Washington in 1947. Mm -hmm. um, I lived in a small town south of Seattle when I was born Burien, Washington. Um, but most of my time was in Seattle, moved to Seattle when I was probably in the second or third, you know, year of my life. And uh, grew up around Woodland Park, and went to Lincoln High School and, you know, lived up by Woodland Park in that area. Everybody knows from North Seattle's at and I was close to that. So I see your calico. We have four cats and I can't <clears throat> assure you that not all of them might be on this piece sometime. Well, I have two cats, one named Angus. He's an uh, Abyssinian cat. He's a curious little one. I have a, I had, that was our rescue cat. You just saw Lee. <clears throat> but we also have a white cat. His name is Indiana. He came from Moscow, Russia. He's a Maine Coon. Oh. <clears throat> if he walks through, the screen will block. He's that big. Do they sit on your lap when you're talking on the Zoom? Sleep on my head. Okay. My my favorite kitty, Casey, um, passed away on April 10th after about 15 years. Okay. And he used to actually sit with me when I drew. So our condolences. It was a, as we all know, all of us of age know. Um, when you lose a pet, it's pretty hard, but you have to remember all the good years that you had them, not just the time you lost them. But that guy right there is pretty cool. He just walked by again. So there's no telling what they're going to do. I don't I don't try and control them. <laughs> oh, why should you? They got their mind of their own. <laughs> yeah, I hate to put it this way, but as long as they go to the bathroom where they're supposed to, I'm happy as I can be. So the schools that you had gone to, what did you major in then? Well, the at Lincoln High School, what happened? Let me tell you a little story. Um, I was one of those kids who played Sandlot football with a lot of friends of mine. Hello, cat. Right. Played a Sandlot football with a lot of my friends. And no pads. We just smash into each other a couple of days every week, you know, mm -hmm. Saturday and Sundays at the park. And one day uh, I smashed into a guy who was much bigger than me and he didn't like it. So he smashed back into me oh. and broke my <laughs> and broke my left arm. So I couldn't play football. And so one day I was sitting on the couch in my house and picked up a magazine that had Catherine Hepburn on the cover. I think it was a Life magazine, I believe. I should check that out sometime. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, drew her portrait and everybody loved it. And that kind of perked the interest in being an artist. And right away, that, that was the summer of uh, uh, 40, uh, 52, no, 62, summer of 62. And uh, I just started taking art courses at Lincoln High School that I everything I could take that was art I took and because uh, that was my interest I knew there was something there I wanted to do and I just wasn't sure I was like a young kid you know mm. but then all through Lincoln I took all the art courses I could possibly take and then I joined the Marine Corps in 1966 so thank you my dad was in the Royal Canadian Air Force thank you for Second his World service War. thank you for his service I know what that's about. I when I came it. back, when I come back from Vietnam in 1968, um, right after I got out of the Marine Corps, I, I went to, uh, I made the decision, probably the most important decision of my life, and that was to go to art school 
And I ended up going to the Burnley School of Professional Art. It's now become the Seattle Art Institute or Art Institute of the country, I guess. And uh, that was my smartest decision because I took three years of courses from professional commercial artists who actually took the time to teach me what I needed to know. And uh, mm. that was a smart decision on my part. And, I, and after Vietnam, I'm surprised I was able to make that kind of a smart decision so quickly. But I had a wonderful person that I was with and she made sure that uh, everything was taken care of and I was supported through that whole time. And that's why I'm, that's pretty much why I'm where I'm at today. So how long have you been an artist? Um, I got out of art school in 1971. I think, I, you know, I was that artist in high school who got in trouble for writing on everybody and everything. Yeah. <laughs> I like to tell people that in high school, I was a perfect C student, except in art where I excelled. So I guess I've been an artist my whole life. It just took some time for the ability to be an artist. So what did just you because, Well, just because you're artistic doesn't make you an artist. Um, there's a lot of patience and a lot of hard work that goes into it. Any artist will tell you that. And uh, a lot of sacrifice. But I wouldn't trade everything I've done to get to here, um, even the bad stuff, because it's made me who I am right now. So, so he's bedding down here. <laughs> I love cats. Yeah, it couldn't be any more perfect. It's beautiful. It's two and a half years old, this kid. You know, it's interesting. When I was in high school, I hope I, I'll just tell you the story. When I was in high school, I dated a young woman who I cared for a great deal, still do. Mm -hmm. Her dad was a local commercial artist. His name was Gus Swanberg, Chuck Swanberg. Mm -hmm. And uh, I watched him do his business. I watched him do his job. And it's like, that. I kept saying, that's what I want to be. Okay, not realizing how difficult it was going to be to do that. And he knew it too. And so he, you know, during high school, while I was dating his daughter, you know, he helped me out, taught me a lot of stuff that I don't think he realized he was teaching me. He actually discouraged me from being an artist because he said to really be a successful artist takes a, a great deal of patience and uh, some heartbreak. Yeah. And he says, you got to understand this. But when I came back from Vietnam, um, I married his daughter and went to art school. Mm-hmm. And, and the professional art school. Mm -hmm. And of course, he was one of the teachers my third year. <laughs> and he said, well, you made it this far. He said, so let me teach you what you need to know now. And uh, he says, I'll, he says, we'll get you where you want to be. And he did. He uh, actually took me aside and, and uh, was hard on me, but fair. And he taught me all that stuff. So Gus Swanberg, I noticed in uh, some of the questions people ask me sometimes, they want to know who my mentors were. Mm -hmm. Gus Swanberg was one of them because of what I just told you. And then another guy I met in art school who I still have as a good friend, another artist named Austin Dwyer. Um, what these guys taught me was there's never going to be the best artist in the country. There's just going to be a lot of artists and then some are going to be part of the very good artists. He said, what you need to do to succeed is you have to plan on trying to be one of the very good artists that other people want to participate with you know it's like writing it's like doing what you do it's music whatever um, there's a lot of people out there who have the talent a lot of people who um, have the breaks um, but anybody can actually succeed um, if they work hard enough yeah. if they have if they're lucky enough to have some of the people I've had in my life and uh, that's why I'm here again um, Vietnam also taught me a lot about life period. Um, I was a combat veteran at the DMZ in 67 and 68 um, with the Marine Corps. And so I learned a lot about life and death. So when I returned from war, um, I was pretty, I was real clear on what I needed to do for the rest of my life. I just wasn't sure what those elements were going to be of what I was going to do. Not the case today. I know exactly what I'm doing today. <clears throat> So uh, you pick portraits to do. Yeah, I was, uh, we had a dinner theater in Seattle called the Cirque Dinner Theater. <laughs> and we would bring a lot of actors like Van Johnson and, and you know, a lot of people I could name, but I'm, I, I wouldn't name them and maybe your viewers wouldn't know who they were. I um, would. <laughs> well, you know, you, well, you and I speak the same language. I was, you know, I wasn't going to say that, you know, but it's like, <laughs> um, 
a lot of actors and actresses from 50 years ago would come through there because that's what my age was. Yeah. And so I'd meet a lot of them. And uh, for, for six years, I, I did portraits at the dinner theater. I'd gotten divorced from my friends, from my mentor's daughter. Oh. And uh, that was, that was harsh. It, it, it took some, you know, some things away. Yeah. Um, but the Cirque Dinner Theater kind of filled some of that void. And I started meeting a lot of celebrities and I uh, came up with this idea. Since I'm meeting with these people, uh, maybe I could get them to autograph some blank illustration boards that I could then redraw on <coughs> around the country. Mm -hmm. And uh, that decision changed my life in a way that I wouldn't realize for about 30 years. And uh, because they all knew me, I mean, there was no, it was not a question. They just, they loved to help me out because they liked what I was doing for the theater. And uh, we started raising a lot of money for charity. And then I kind of got a good idea. I said one time, God's given me a gift and I hope I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing with it. And uh, what happened it was, did. yeah, I mean, it became very clear to me the first time I sold one of my portraits. This is a, you know, 40 years ago mm -hmm. for $2,000. Uh, it was autographed by a celebrity and then I thought well maybe this idea has got some merit and since that time and I think I sent you the video yes. in 2004 of uh, Evening Magazine did if I didn't I will um, where they actually did a story on me because they realized I'd raised about 10 million dollars for local charities with these <laughs> signed drawings which was uh <laughs> It did exactly what I wanted it to do. I just didn't know I wanted it to do that. <laughs> You're just following what God has led you into. Hey, you know, it's like <clears throat> I was trying to do, I was trying to help um, in any way I could. And I'm just a regular human being like everybody else. I don't have a lot of money. Um, but I was fortunate enough to have this ability and and I was presented with this avenue to follow, and I did. And uh, let me put it the way a Gold Star dad did. In case anybody doesn't know what a Gold Star family member is, a Gold Star family member is someone who lost somebody in war. Yeah. Gold Star dad called me one day after we get into what we're going to talk about the project. Um, he said to me, you know, all the work you're doing for the Gold Star families is doing for you. And of course, I didn't know what he was talking about because it's I do it for free. Um, he said, your soul has gotten to come home from Vietnam. You the hear second, it. Yep. The second he said it, you know, I had always thought that, you know, I'd, can, I'd come home. OK, but a piece oh, of me yeah. hadn't. Yeah. And uh, he, he, he let me know what that piece was. So all of those things that we've been talking about, that's led me to hear. Um, had, an, had, had a number of intentions, but one of the results was um, I got to be whole again. And when you're yeah. whole, yeah. you find that you, you think better, you make better decisions. And when you're not in pain, you make better decisions. And, and so my wife and I sat down and we discussed uh, what the direction needed to be with my ability and with my understandings and uh and with some things that i've been finding new just in my experiences and the fallen hero portrait project became the thing i needed to do how long have you been doing that here um 18 years, 18 years? Started in late 2003 yes sir i've drawn i've drawn just because i don't want to forget this i've drawn over 8,000 free fallen hero portraits for the families of the fallen across the United States, Poland, Germany, Canada. Germany. Betcha. And in fact, um, the ones I did in Poland, I did every soldier that died in Afghanistan and Iraq in this war in the country of Poland. And they ended up giving me two years ago, they flew a general to Seattle and they actually gave me the Polish Armed Forces Medal. Hi. That's great. See this thing I'm wearing around my neck? Yeah, I was just going to ask about that. That's the... See? United States, this is the United States Civilian Medal of Honor. This was I, voted, voted on by nothing but Medal of Honor recipients from the United States. 
Then they flew my wife and I back in 2015 to Washington, D.C. <laughs> and on Medal of Honor Day, March 25th, 2015, a Medal of Honor recipient from Vietnam and another Medal of Honor recipient standing next to him put this around my neck and uh, read the proclamation. And that year, the service medal was only given to one person, and that was me. I still am amazed when I think about all the wonderful things people do all over the country and how they chose me, but they assure me that uh, it wasn't by accident. I think what you are doing is the best thing that's helping to heal others as well, to Thank you. give them a gift of the loved ones that they have missed. The know visual, that yeah, the visuals they have, again, being a combat veteran myself, yes, sir. You know, on March 28th, 1968, to give a little um, background on this, I was at, I, I'd been at the DMZ in 67 and 68, mm -hmm. and we were moved to this place called Camelot Regional Headquarters. And it was yeah. supposed to be a safer place. It is? Well, it was supposed to be. Supposed. But the morning we got there, uh, the Viet, Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese hit us, rockets and attack and stuff and they were trying to kill us oh. and uh during the battle we were able a bunch of us to get to our wounded mm -hmm. and uh one of my high school buddies peter arms petter armstrong um was killed instantly so he was the first person i'd gotten to but then the second person who was still alive was a young man friend of mine named vincent santanello from queens new york yes and Vinny was our male guy, and he was the guy we all love to see because that's how we got anything from home, oh, you know. Yeah. And it had been a while since we'd seen anything, but Vinny was there at the wrong time. So I picked up Vinny in my arms and my two corpsmen, Doc Malazzo and Doc Nunn, John Nunn and Tony Malazzo, yeah. went to work on Vinny. We were trying to keep him alive. And uh, we were young kids, you have to remember, you know, femoral arteries and things like that. We yeah. probably knew what they were, but we probably didn't understand the impact of when they're severed. And he had had some bad shrapnel wounds, Vincent had. We called him Saint, by the way. Um, he wasn't going to make it. And at the last few minutes of his life, and I was <laughs> holding him so he wouldn't be alone, mm -hmm. and we were all trying, everybody was trying to keep him alive. He looked up at me and he says, Mike, I just want to go home. And he closed yeah. his eyes and died. Hey. And Lord. that's the face. Well, that's the face I see every day. And if you look back up behind me. Oh, the cap. Yep. That's Vincent. And. Uh, you were young. How old young were you? 19. 19. Ooh. We were babies. Like I said, uh, when my wife and I were talking about this the other night, we went over. I, got, I joined the Marine Corps when I was 18 mm -hmm. and uh, went to Vietnam when I was 19 and I came back 30. You grew up quickly. Yeah, in just a short period of time. Saw things that we still see today, and especially with what's going on right now. Afghanistan. Um, yeah. Um, not sleeping very well. Uh, none of my friends are. But either are the, I, the many Gold Star families that I've talked to. In fact, I walked with the Gold Star mother last night because she just not, she needed to, you know, we needed to be together to discuss what's going on because she lost her son, Eric Ward, in the war, this war. Wow. And uh, there's a whole bunch of pain out there that's being resurrected because of what's going on right now. And uh, what I'm trying to do is I'm just trying to help them. Um, You're doing a good job, sir. Well, I, I love these people. I, you know, I don't... I had a person, a mother, write me one time. She said, a Gold Star mom, and she says, obviously, you don't really need to know somebody to love them. Well, the love and the respect I have for these Gold Star family members, siblings, mm -hmm. moms and dads, all over, grandmothers all over the country, is not based in politics, is based in emotion and respect. I've been where their kids were, men and women, old and young, every race. I've been there. Um, I know what that loss is. You know, I, I had a Gold Star mother pay me a really incredible compliment the other day. Yeah. 18 years ago, when I started this project, I knew how I felt when I lost Vincent. Um, 
but that was my feeling of losing my friend. It wasn't my feeling as a mother or a father losing their child. It's a different, uh, different type of grief. And uh, they paid me a compliment. They said, after 18 years and 8,000 portraits for Gold Star families, you understand our grief as well as we do. And it's pretty powerful. You know, it, it doesn't go away. You just you yeah. learn to manage with it. So what I've tried to do, and my wife helps me do this, is dedicate ourselves to um, the health of the families of this country who have given so much to this country. Mental health or physical? Mental, physical, spiritual. Um, I say a prayer every day before I draw uh, to do the, that I'll do the best job I can. And... Uh, <laughs> You know, I have this belief that when I'm sitting with a soldier and I every day I do this every day, um, I can talk to them. Once I get their eyes done, I can talk to them. And uh, I think Vincent's sitting with them in heaven and he gives me the information I need because Vinny and I are always going to be connected since March 28th. Right. And uh, in fact, I don't want to forget this. There's a great book that was written by Vincent's nephew, Ralph oh. Morales, who was named after Vincent, okay, on Vincent's life. But about seven or eight of the chapters cover the time Vincent and I were together all the way through when he died and the work we did. It's called A Saint's Letters from the Depths of Hell wow. by Ralph Morales. It's powerful reading. I recommend this for anybody who really wants to know what's going on in war. OK, it's fiction, but it's fiction derived from a lot of people like me who were really there that during that time. So it's pretty real. It's pretty raw. Mm. Um, it's meant to be. Um, but it tells an incredible story about an incredible man that's led to an incredible project. When <laughs> Ralph wanted, when Ralph when Ralph first uh, decided to write this book. He didn't know his uncle. No, nope, you know, the people were gone who could give him any information. He needed to find people like us, Vinny, mm -hmm. Doc, me, a bunch of other guys. And he didn't know how he was going to do that. This project and a piece similar to what we're doing right now mm -hmm. done by ABC uh, led me to Ralph in Queens which led to this book because of all the people that we were able to introduce to Ralph. So when you look at stuff like that, and yeah. you look, look at all the offshoots of things that have happened, it's impossible to not see the spiritual component to this project. It's like you know a I mean? domino effect, really. One affects the other and continues. I, I think, it. yeah, I think, um, I work with dead people every day and uh, it, it's incredibly, well, a lot of my days are pretty sad because I know the specifics of the people who have died in the war. Yeah. Plus I have, I have that additional experience so that I'm not only hearing it, but I'm realizing it. You know, when you hear something about horrible, mm -hmm. and if you haven't experienced that particular horrible, you have a way to shield yourself from actually feeling that. I don't. So how do you help yourself through these uh, sad times in, when you're Well, I talk to a lot of Gold Star moms and dads. They, they're always, I got a Gold Star mom. Her name's Annie Murphy, and she lives in Upper New York. Mm -hmm. She calls me once a week, and she's been doing it ever since I drew her son, Michael, mm -hmm. um, just to check on me to make sure I'm okay. I'm, I'm pretty well taken care of. But at the end of the day, every day, when I'm done drawing, I take a six mile walk and I end up at a veterans plaza in Edmonds, Washington, where I live, mm. where Peter and Vinny have pavers that I actually am able to take some time and say good night to them. Can I tell you a story about how the project actually started? No. Okay. As I said to you, I used to do portraits of celebrities and we do fundraisers with them with the signed boards. 
and we'd raise like $10 million. Mm. And so Evening Magazine did a piece on me in 2003. And again, I can send that to you if you haven't, if I already have it. Sure, I'd like to see. It's a, uh, remember to turn up the sound because it was transferred from tape when I send it to you. Okay. But what it is, is they realized that I've raised millions of dollars with my drawings. <clears throat> but one of the group of people that I was, now remember, I'm an artist and I'm a Marine. So I was the artist with the Playboy Playmates for six years. And during my interview with Evening Magazine, I mentioned that, okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And of course, that brings all kinds of interesting reactions. I bet it did. <laughs> and after a seven-hour interview, after I answered the question, it actually ended the interview, which was really good because I was tired, you know? Mm -hmm. But NBC decided because of the comment that I worked with the Playmates, who are wonderful people, by the way, um, send it around the world. Wow. You know, a young woman who had just lost, I didn't know this, but a young woman who had lost her husband in Iraq in 2003, saw it in Boise, Idaho, and she called me and she said, uh, how much would you charge me to draw my husband? Now, at the time, I thought I was going to be rich because I was on TV and everybody was going to start calling me for work. You know what I mean? Artists mm -hmm. think, right? Mm -hmm. Then she said he was a corpsman. He died in 2003 in Iraq. And being a Marine, corpsmen are the bravest people I know. And uh, I said, I'd do it for free for her. Yes, I couldn't possibly charge her, you know. Yes, so I drew her portrait and sent it to her. And, and uh, one morning, a couple of days after I sent it, uh, my wife and I were driving out to actually get me a haircut. And that is funny. Um, <laughs> Sharice Johnson called me and she said, I received the portrait you've got of my husband yesterday. Mm -hmm. She said, I want to tell you, though. She says, in the year my husband's been dead, she said, um, I've not slept a full night's through. Mm -hmm. She said, everybody that loves me, takes care of me, takes me to the doctor. They make sure I eat. They hold me. They cry with me. They sit with me. But I've not slept a full night's through. She said, yesterday I got the portrait of Michael, her husband. And she said, I looked into his eyes and she says, as I pulled it out of the envelope and she said, I started talking to him and we talked for hours. We were able to finish a lot of the conversations we hadn't been able to finish. Closure, Ca therapy, really. At the end of the two so. hours, she said to me, her words, I looked into his eyes and I said, I love you. Mm. And she said, I felt him look back at me and say, I love you too and I'm okay. Then she said to me, she said, I'm only calling for one reason. And I said, what's that? She said, I'm calling to say thank you. Yeah. She said, because last night's the first night in a year I've slept all night. That, see, that's, that, that's, what we, that's what your gift is, to help people become whole again in, deep inside, especially their psyche. Their, you know, their, we, we, nobody, nobody truly understands the type of love it takes to reach a place that people don't really understand exists. And that's that pain place. Yeah. But when I got done with that phone call, I looked at my wife and I said, now we need to do them all. And she says, how are you going to do that? I said, well, I, I'm, I know I can do the art because I've been doing portraits forever. Yeah. And uh, so that's not a problem. She says, how are we paying for that? And I said, I'm going to turn that over to God. I said, we don't have the money to do what I'm about to do, but if we're fortunate, things will happen. And again, like I said, that was 18 years ago. And here I am. You know. God speed my love until we meet again. You're always in my heart and every dream. Don't let this time apart give in to all our fears. God will keep us close from up above. So until we meet again, Godspeed, my love. God is with us always for the rest of all our lives.